good morning. Hope you guys are feeling uh, better than I'm feeling, but I'm here. <laughs> so before we get started with my topic, which is setting and achieving high impact uh, growth goals, I wanted to talk about an observation that I've seen in growth and marketing in recent years, and that's that there's a shift to a holistic approach to growth and marketing, and traditionally it's been much more surface level. You know, initially it was just channels, just uh, executing experiments maybe in ads and other things, and then a group of us, many people here, fought to, to get landing pages and sort of surface level optimization, and that, that was effective. That was, became a really big advantage for a lot of companies. But what we've seen in recent years is that you've got these super fast growing companies like Facebook or Airbnb or Uber, and they've taken that whole process of optimization across the full customer journey, and it's really powerful. It's created some really valuable companies. Uh, the challenge is, Somebody asked the question about the politics of the homepage. Imagine the politics of the customer journey. Imagine the politics of deep optimizations inside the product. That's really hard. Uh, it's, it's really hard to get everybody on the same page. And so one of the keys to making that work is to have really clear goals and a process for achieving those goals that includes everyone within the company. So if you don't have goals, what happens? First, the team is completely out of sync. One group's working on this goal, and let's say, for example, the uh, marketing team is working on maximizing leads. But in doing that, some of those leads might be positive ROI leads, but they're leads that convert at a lower percentage. And so another team is doing optimization of activation, and they're really mad at marketing because they just sent lower quality leads that are profitable, but they're lower quality. So they're out of sync, and there they're, they're creates conflict and, and issues within the company. And then when all of that starts to happen, growth stalls, and uh, it's really painful, and uh, I experienced it. I experienced it at Log Me In. So um, Log Me In, I Went in there, this was, this was a while ago, but I went in in the early days there, you know, customer zero, we start building channels, and I went through the battle that I talked about. Like I, I said, we, we need to be able to optimize these landing pages. I actually hired a design engineer on my team. We had uh, the, the pieces in place, the analysts, the pieces in place, but the IT team did not want marketing touching anything on the website. And uh, fortunately, this, this was like 2003, 2004, so it was, uh, those times have changed. There's, there's products like uh, Unbounce that, that make it a lot easier to do these things, but at that time we had to basically negotiate a subdomain just to run landing pages, and, uh, but it still wasn't very effective. Basically, I could not spend more than $10,000 a month even though we had those landing pages, and the, and the big issue was that people we're signing up, so we, we were optimizing to the sign up, but they were never actually using the product. They didn't use the product, they're not gonna tell their friends about it, they're not gonna pay us anything ever, they're never coming back. So all of our ROI was based on them actually using the product, yet over 90% of the signups never used the product. So that's a really hard business to grow. Fortunately, I had a, a very good CEO that I could present the data to and say, we're not gonna grow very fast as a business unless we figure out how to, how to get this full customer journey to where we're actually delivering value to the users. And as a team, we all work together. He, he basically, when he saw the data, he said, we need to get the product team, the engineering team, marketing, all working together to fix this issue. And when we did, we actually were able to get 10 times as many people who signed up to actually use the product. And what does that mean in terms of our ability to grow the business? So everybody talks about, you know, give me a growth hack. It, it's, you know, it's, it's this combination of doing a lot of things right, and it's not about like one big creative new channel. I had no new creativity that I needed to grow the business, in this case externally. Once we got a 10x improvement in the number of users who signed up and used the product, we went back and tested the same channels we'd previously tested. Instead of scaling to 10,000, we could now scale them to a million dollars a month. And with a three-month return on investment, Log Me In was uh, cash flow positive all the way through our IPO filing. And uh, today, it's a, a $5 billion company. And I don't think it would even be in business today if we hadn't figured out how to get the full team working together to address really the issues that were holding back growth. So the impact of the right goals is huge within a company. 
And what we're going to focus on today is how do you set those goals and actually achieve those goals. So the, really the key benefit is that it keeps everybody focused on the highest leverage opportunities in the business to, to grow the business. And when you achieve those objectives, people feel progress. People celebrate together. It gets everybody on the same page and it actually makes growth sustainable. If you're not doing that, growth is, is much less sustainable. And so about six months after I left Log Me In, I joined Dropbox, and literally, just to bring that same playbook that had worked really well at, Drop, at, at Log Me In, and thought, let's, let's in the really early days, try to, try to get that full customer journey working together, put the systems in place so that, as a team, everyone can work together to achieve the goals. And just within the last, I think, six weeks, Dropbox announced that they're the fastest SaaS company to ever reach the $1 billion revenue run rate. So you can see they, they, for the first time in a long time, reported what their growth numbers actually look like. And you can see that that trajectory that we started in those first six months carried on and continues to carry on today. And I, th I think it's because we, we put the systems in place. So that's what we're going to talk about. How do you actually achieve high impact goals? And uh, it all starts with the goal. It all starts with picking the right goal. And we'll talk about how you pick the right goal in a minute. And then communicating the specifics of that goal. So just having the goal, if nobody knows what the goal is, it's, it's not going to make much of an impact. So communicating the specifics across the organization and then starting to focus resources on achieving that goal. So that the resources are money, resources are people, attention, just a desire to achieve that goal. And then using a proven process. And fortunately for, for a lot of you, that process is going to look just like the, the same process that we use on a, on a surface level optimization, but just applying it to every single variable that moves growth within the business. So the right high impact objective, the starting point that I like to do is actually define what is the core experience of the product that delivers value to the users. That's the starting point that I do. And so I, I go and find who are the most passionate users. I usually do it through surveying, because with a survey, you can dig in and, and understand, uh, understand a lot more context around how they're using the product, the benefit that they're getting. But once I understand the core value, that's what drives retention. I start to document all of the pieces of the customer journey that lead to the output of growth. And growth is uh, best defined in something that we call a North Star metric. Growth, is, I think the North Star metric is really something that Facebook pushed harder than anybody. Actually, on the Facebook team, um, I, the guy who was running international growth then went to Uber to run growth. And he said he thought the most important thing that Facebook did was have a single North Star metric that the entire Facebook team could focus on. And, and just having a single long-term metric, that's, that's another way to get everybody in sync and on the same page. So we'll talk what is a North Star metric in a minute. But basically, when you understand the output of your North Star metric, the output of your growth, and the variables that lead to improvements in that growth, then you can start to find where, where do we have leverage within that model. So the log me in example that I gave you, if we didn't fix activation, we weren't going to have retention. We weren't going to be able to spend money to effectively acquire new users. So that was a really important place for us to focus. It tends to be for a lot of companies. This is actually uh, just a an assumption of what LinkedIn's growth model looks like. But everybody's going to have a different growth model. And it's really important to document what is the path, what are the motivations, what are the experiences. And the more that you can understand that, the more that you can look for opportunities to improve it. So the North Star metric, as I said, that's the, I think that's one of the most important things in driving long-term growth. Have that single metric. So instead of having, as we talked about, a marketing team that's trying to maximize leads and, and another team that's trying to maximize conversion rate on leads and, and sometimes you pull in different directions, if everybody has a single long-term metric, then you can understand as a team what what you're focusing on so that you can move that long-term metric. And a North Star metric, the best way to understand it is it's, it's units of value that is, are being delivered to your customers. So um, an example would be Airbnb. Every time someone books a night and stays in an Airbnb property, there's value that's created for the host. There's value that's created for the guests. For Uber, if somebody takes a ride, there's value that's created for the driver. There's value that's created for the rider. Uh, for uh, Facebook, just daily active users. 
It's not how many profiles have been created, because if it's a ghost town profile, there's not value that's being created there. It's, it's it, people who come back every day, that creates value in that network. So figuring out what your North Star metric is, is, is really important for everyone then to understand what is their role in moving that North Star metric. Once, and, and then you're really, the short-term goals are about what, where is that highest leverage point in moving that North Star metric? And maybe you're gonna have more than one goal, so you can have you know, two or three goals if you, if you have enough people on the team, but they're relatively short-term goals, usually you know, kind of a few weeks to maybe a couple of months. You wanna be really aggressive with those goals and give, team, give the overall team the context on what's gonna happen if we achieve this goal? What does, what does that do to our model? If we could double conversion rate here, what do we think is gonna happen with the rest of our model? And that, that can really help people focus on, on generating that, uh, that, or on hitting that goal. So, but be specific. This is the baseline, this is where we are, this is where we think we need to get to, this is the amount of time that we want to spend trying to get there, and, uh, and then you can track progress against it. Then it's all about focusing the team and resources on achieving that goal. So um, as I said, limit short-term goals. So it, you know, obviously if you have 15 goals, if the point of having a goal is to focus those resources, then you're much less likely to be, you're gonna dilute across all of those goals. So have, have a reasonable number of goals. If you're a small team, one, maybe two or three is okay. If you're a much bigger team, you might be able to carry more than that, but uh, you, you wanna be somewhat careful on how many goals you have. And then assign a goal, an owner to that goal. So someone who's thinking about that goal all the time and really rallying the team around the goal. And they're passionate about the goal. They think this is a really important goal to achieve and they're committed to achieving it. They, they think that they actually have a, a good chance to, to hit it. I also think it's important not to have direct financial incentive for hitting that goal because what happens is they're going to sandbag the goal. They're gonna <laughs> try to make the goal a lot lower so that they can hit it. So I think it's good to have direct financial incentive for the long-term North Star metric for everybody to, uh, who's, who's doing these goals to have some kind of bonus tied to the output that is the shared responsibility of everybody. But these, you, you wanna be really aggressive. And it's okay if you don't hit it, but you wanna have it so that it's just within reach, but, but really aggressive, because that inspires a lot of creativity and a lot of just digging deep to try to hit the goal. And then once you've, once you've defined the goal, a lot of time those goals are gonna fit are gonna fall outside of, say, the marketing team to maybe within the product team. So growth is cross-functional. Everybody in the organization is affecting, uh, is affecting growth in a different way, but is affecting growth, so you wanna be able to rally the team around hitting that goal. So an example on my team of a goal that we had set in, in recent months was uh, we, we launched a new product and we had a really bad activation rate. And I knew from my log me in days that we were able to improve like 10x the activation rate. So I put a really aggressive goal against the activation rate and I said, I, I think we can do a 300% improvement in activation in 30 days. And my VP of engineering said, you're crazy. <laughs> and uh, so I was a little bit deflating, but I said, okay, what, what do you think? So, you know, how much should I lower it by? It was in my mind, but I didn't even put that. I just said, so what do you think? What, what do you think is a reasonable goal? It's like 45 days. <laughs> okay, yeah, 45 days, that'll work. Um, if that's all it is. So it was good that I didn't plant the seed of, low should we cut it in half? Um, but he basically, once, once he committed to that 45 days, so normally a VP of engineering is not gonna be involved in trying to hit goals, but once he debated it and thought, is it reasonable or not, he literally went to lunch that day and, said, and decided, I, I think I know how to hit that goal. He prototyped, prototyped something by the end of, of, uh, of the day and um, he, he was able to actually get it launched within, you know, probably two weeks or something, and then within 20 days we'd actually hit the goal. So I think part of it is you're having those debates, but really I first emphasized the importance of hitting that goal, and then we had some debate in how we hit the goal, but he was able to creatively apply his unique insights to hit the goal and his skill set to hit the goal. So I think that's a, an, important, uh, an important part in hitting goals. So once you've 
define the goals, define the period of time to hit the goals. You have a lot of context around, around what, is, uh, what it is you're trying to do. Then, then you apply a process that looks just like the optimization process that we use on uh, surface level pages, which looks just like the scientific process that's been around for a million years, maybe not a million, but a lot. Um, and it's define the objective, analyze the situation, generate ideas, prioritize those ideas, test them, have hypotheses around those ideas, learn through the testing, refine your analysis, and just keep repeating that as you make progress against the goal. So analysis of the situation should not just be quantitative analysis, but it should also be qualitative analysis. So really understanding the situation. If I, if I have lots of people that aren't taking the step, it's not just a matter of throwing a bunch of tests at that step, it's a matter of trying to figure out why are they not taking that step. And combining any quantitative and qualitative analysis that you have to really inspire and help you understand the types of tests you should run. So an example, I talked about at Log Me In where we had the entire funnel that we were applying the, the process to, um, and we, we saw that big benefit, but Later on, we, we had to repeat it, so that was something that Guy was talking about, that you want to repeat optimization. So we had a new channel that came in, and it had 20,000 daily signups, and, and then they were really cheap. I think we were paying like 20 cents a signup for these 20,000 signups, but most of them didn't use the product. So I had kind of just that same problem that I had before, and yeah, you know, we're all figuring this stuff out as we go. Uh, the, my initial instinct was, let's just test a bigger button. They must not see the download button. Yeah, <laughs> eventually you run out of page. So, you know, and, and the old button color test that everybody makes fun of, we did it. You know, what, whatever it took to, to, try, to get, try to get people to click and download. But we finally got the idea, let's just ask them. They actually register, so we have their email address. Let's just ask them, why did you sign up for this product and not download? And when we asked the question, we got the same answer back over and over, which was, I don't believe it's free. So this was kind of still the early days of freemium. Okay, now we have a problem that we're solving against. They don't believe it's free. Our next test, we gave them two download buttons, kind of counterintuitive to best practices. Um, but we gave them download the free version of the software or download a trial of the paid version. Once they saw that we had a paid version, we had credibility that the free version was really free. We put a big graphical check mark on the free version and had a 300% improvement in the downloads once, once we did that, which still wasn't great, but it made the channel viable for us. So idea generation should really be problem solving. It's not just like creative, creative, you know, I can't think of a nice word for creativity, but uh, it's creative something. Um, and when you're solving a problem, you're, you're going to be directing the energy towards something that's more meaningful. And you can do that in weekly brainstorming sessions. You can do it. You never know when you're going to get the idea. But when you understand the problem, you're much more likely to actually come up with good solutions to that problem. Encourage ideation from across the organization. It, you know, a lot of times, a customer success team who normally wouldn't be in testing, they're going to have unique insights because they're involved day to day with the challenges that people are having, our customer support team. Uh, I, I mentioned our uh, VP of engineering coming up with an idea. You just never know where the idea is gonna be. So the more context you can set, the more you can share the situation, you're more likely to bring people into the process that are gonna generate that breakthrough idea. A Little bit of training on, on when they're entering in ideas, when they're giving you ideas, teaching them to not just uh, not just randomly like write three words for the idea, but try to organize it as, as an experiment doc where they have a hypothesis, they're clear about what they're trying to achieve with that idea, because if it doesn't work, then you, then you have the details around what did you actually try, so in the future you don't try it again, unless you're doing it to re-verify it, as Guy talked about. Um, and then having a scoring model, so um, we like to use an, an ICE model for scoring ideas. What's nice by having a scoring model is that you give feedback to the person who came up with the idea. That's a really good idea, but on the ease score, it, it's, it's not a very easy idea to score, and that's why we haven't yet run it. But, um, so you want to score it on impact. If this works, is this potentially a game changer? It's kind of a guess. It's really hard to know what that impact score is, but at least thinking through, is this something that could be game changing or is this gonna be uh, just pretty incremental and small? Do I have some customer research or 
other things that I've seen that make me think that this has a high likelihood of working and then just how easy is it to test. The benefit of that scoring is that you now can start to compare in an Excel sheet or whatever, one idea to another idea to, to figure out which one you want to run. Um, and you should be looking at those ideas in terms of the objectives. So again, it's not, it, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't just be randomly testing things. You should be testing the things that apply to those high leverage opportunities that you've already identified earlier. And then a lot of the fastest growing companies have a weekly growth meeting that's this cross-functional growth meeting that includes people like your VP of product, even your CEO. I mean, talk, talk, what's the most important metric for a CEO? It's, it's the sustainability of customer and revenue growth. So if you can get the CEO involved, like I did with Log Me In, you're much more likely to get people aligned to actually, to actually work together to achieve the objectives. So, what I like to do is people who are on the core growth team nominate a couple of ideas in advance so you think about, so you're not just sort of saying, I can't remember why I wanted to do this, but maybe we should do this, but they're, they're coming in with a crisp 30 second pitch. This is why I think this is a good idea. And even if you don't pick that idea, they're gonna feel like at least they were heard. And then after everybody's made their pitches, figuring out based on the resources that you have, based on the expected impact, these are the three or four ideas that we're gonna run this week. And Get the, get the tests out as quickly as possible, assign a project manager to it who's passionate, thinks it's gonna work. Otherwise, a lot of times they uh, will go a little extreme on the minimum of a minimum viable test and uh, to the point where it has no chance of working. So you want someone who's passionate that's gonna work and then they negotiate on the resources of just, just easy enough that it gets done but still enough of a test that they think it'll work. And then, you're testing for impact on the goal. So it's, you, you, what I've found is that when you start to run a high velocity of tests, the analysis of those tests starts to build way up and, and a backlog for analyzing the tests. And the whole purpose of testing is to learn and make progress against the objective. So the next week, if you haven't analyzed the test yet, you're not gonna be as smart when you're picking the next set of tests. So just, I like to kind of triage that analysis by impact on the objective, and then if there's more analyst cycles to, to dig deeper into the data, they can look for unexpected edge cases, but start with the hypothesis and impact, and then uh, the goal should really be to, to put as many tests out, but, but staying with some of the uh, important important best practices around testing. I know everybody hates that best practices word, but they're still you know, important uh, practices that you should do in how you formulate and, and run a test and analyze a test. Um, but finding that balance of doing it right, but as many as you can possibly do. Um, I, I think there's a couple of good examples here that Twitter actually hit a wall with their growth in 2010. New VP of product came in and said, we're only running a couple of tests a month. That's not enough. We need to run a lot more tests than that. He upped it to about 10 tests a week. As soon as they did that, they, they started to accelerate their growth because you don't learn anything until you run the tests. I did that at my own company. I was out raising money for, for uh, you know, a, a second round of, of financing and while I was away, they said we're testing, but they were literally doing very f infrequent tests. And I came back and I had looked at that Twitter data and I said, guys, any week where we don't run at least three, three tests, we failed on the inputs that are gonna lead to the outputs of growth. We can't control the output of growth, but we can control the inputs. So any week where we don't run at least three tests, we failed. Any week where we run at least three tests, we at least did our part in trying to make growth happen. As soon as that happened, we, we had like 60% growth over the, next, uh, over the next two months. So uh, the final step is then to analyze the results, report on the progress, share specifically to the team how the test performed. That's gonna keep people engaged in the process, thinking about how to take it to the next level. Um, what's interesting on my team is that you know, a lot of us think about, uh, there's the creative types and the analytical types. My analyst generates more test ideas than anyone in the company because he's living in the data, but he doesn't have exclusive access to the data. Everyone has that access to the data. So get more people involved in the results and the data, you'll get better test ideas. So not only does he have more test ideas, he has the highest win rate on, on tests as well. Um, uh, keep, that'll keep the goals top of mind and then the tests lead to the learning that lead to better tests. 
So it's just all about repeating that process. And again, that's a process that a lot of you are familiar with who are doing optimization, but now applying it to the full customer journey is where you can make a lot more impact in your organization than, than you can if, if you're just at that top level journey, but again, or that top level of the journey. But again, if you're doing the full funnel, the full customer experience, it's a lot harder and hopefully some of this will help you uh, be able to do that. So key takeaways, goal setting is absolutely critical for sustainable growth. Focus the goals on really high leverage opportunities in the business. Communicate the goals widely so everybody knows what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. And then follow a growth process to achieve the goals and uh, you hopefully will see the results that I've seen when I've done this. So Michael mentioned the book, it comes out April 25th. Um, we, we cover a lot of more detail in the book so it'd be great if you can pick up a copy of the book. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Sean. All right, thank you. You've given us all a hell of a lot of stuff to work with when we get home. Uh, let's do some questions, because there are some. All right, have you ever seen a growth hacking model successfully executed at large company? <laughs> Immature markets. Yeah. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> all right. Do you uh, have a template you use to outline the user journey? If so, could you uh, share that, uh, share what that template looks like? So, sorry, one more time. If you have a template uh, that you use to outline the user journey? Um, I mean, I, it's, it's really kind of different for every company. Um, I, I'll share my slides, and you can just kind of take that one that I did for, um, for LinkedIn and replace your, your, your uh, situation to that user journey, but um, yeah, I mean, the important part, I don't think, like it can literally be on a napkin or a whiteboard, but just laying out what are the steps to value. Again, remember, work from understand the core experience of your most passionate users and the benefit that they get from that experience. Everything should key off of that. Work backwards from that to what's the aha moment, what's the first taste that they get of that experience that hopefully they can get relatively quickly. If you find those two things working together, then you're much more likely to, uh, to, to actually be able to drive growth. I, actually, one really fast, uh, something I read on correlation that's pretty interesting. So correlation is important there. You want those things correlated. But I don't know if anybody saw the report that came out recently that the home field advantage in, in sports has dropped significantly in recent years because of Tinder. Just you guys heard about this? What? So the home field advantage, this is like a total correlation example. Everybody thinks that the fans are the reason that there's such a good home field advantage in sports, but I don't think the fans have anything to do with it. The article that I read said that the home field advantage is, like it was statistically a huge drop, and basically the athletes that were on the road were out chasing opposite sex or same sex, whatever, whatever they had going for them, and that was what was hurting the on-the-road <laughs> performance, and Tinder has made it so much easier that they're getting, on average, two hours more sleep, so. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, last one real quick. What was the tactic uh, or tool you used to survey log me in users who did not act on the free download? Uh, literally, super simple, just an email. Like, I, I don't look for statistical significance in surveys. I look for hints on what the hell is going yeah, on. and. The statistical significance comes from the test itself, um, but you know most people are just guessing at it. So if I can get one right in, that's yep. better than one. But you know, in, in our case, we had, we literally had 19,000 people a day or something like that that weren't signing up or weren't downloading, but were giving us their email addresses. So we could we could very quickly get a lot of data on why. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Sean. It was a huge right. pleasure. Thank you, Michael.